Thank you. Got there in the end, I think. Um, hi, I'm Ranjani. I'm a producer. I'm not a writer. And I work at Six to Start. I'm here to talk about the lessons that we learned in creating our audio first interactive fiction experiment, but from a practical implementation point of view, rather than the creative stuff that you'll be hearing throughout this conference. To give you a little bit of context, I thought I'll just explain what Zombies Run, if you haven't heard of it before. It's the world's most popular smartphone fitness game. It's not just me being dramatic with an interbang in the title. We actually have an exclamation point in our name. Um, <laughs> We have um, more than 5 million downloads in iOS and Android. Um, it's an actual running app that gives you statistics while you run and after you run. But the core of the app is the story that it tells you while you're running. And it motivates you to run more by, going, um, by giving you more story as you keep running more. Um, we've realized over the years that the story is really what's impacted our audience in the most unexpected ways. We get. Um, emails from people saying that we've helped them through really dark times in their lives. And it's not just about you know, losing weight and getting in shape. It's about healing your spirit as well. And we love hearing that kind of thing. And we want to bring Zombies Run to more people. So we've been trying things like virtual races and all that. And the thing we've tried last year was our board game. So our board game is the reason that I'm here. And um, we've tried to categorize it. And Matt Butesca, our writer and creator, came up with the label Narrative Legacy Game because it's a hybrid Franken experiment of different things mushed together into one thing, and shortly you'll see why. So the core of this game is an audio choose-your-own-adventure, um, and that's why the board game's here today. Um, it's got a real-time cooperative card game that you play while the app's giving you a story and telling you that zombies are chasing you, so we're simulating running with this real-time mecha mechanic. And the game box also has envelopes with um, story-related artifacts. So you're actually reaching into the box and touching something from the story itself, and you're solving puzzles that the characters that you play in the story are solving in order to progress. And you can play it with one to four players, you can play it for 30 to 60 minutes at a time, and you've totally got a full campaign of about eight hours. This Franken monster experiment took about 18 months from Kickstarter to finish, but started in December 2014 when Matt was noodling about it and fiddled with it for about a year before we applied for funding from the UK Games Fund in order to create an actual prototype. Went to Kickstarter, had a really successful Kickstarter, external play tests while we were developing the story and the mechanic at the same time, because as Chris said in the previous talk, games and stories are a joint system that need to work together really well. Um, we showed it to the public for the very first time at the UK Games Expo in July 2017. Six to Start does things that's not just this board game, so there was a lot of stuff that happened including the board game up until October, November, when we realized, oh god, we've got to get these games out before Christmas. So we did, the game box is about a kilo and a half, and we ordered 4,500 of them. So there was this massive um, truck that came. It was quite an overwhelming experience. <laughs> and um, as you can see, it's basically three months from receiving those to shipping them to recording the final bit of audio and launching 1.0 in December, which is why there's a blood splat there, because it was an intense time. And we've spent most of this year working support, hearing from people who've loved playing it, trying and fixing bugs, and we have a 2.0 releasing at the end of this year um, with more content in it. Um, there's a lot that we've learned over those many years, and I'd like to just share three main things with you here today. So we've got the unique challenges of audio-first interactive fiction, because you're telling the players a story, but you're also making them the lead character in that story. How do you convince them that this is happening to them and they have agency in it? Playtesting your story and mechanics and its importance. I know everybody tells you playtests are important. You need to get people who are not part of your company to play your game. But I'm going to demonstrate to you with three examples how playtesting transformed our game completely and why you should be doing it. And finally, designing your milestones well. I hate the word deadlines, which is why I crossed it out. Because we're all creative people here, not the best at doing a lot of planning, and especially when you have multi-year timelines and a lot of these story-based games, 
it's hard to celebrate the little wins here and there and still hit whatever public commitment you've made. So let's talk about that in a little bit. So firstly, challenges of audio-first interactive fiction. You've got an app that's telling you the story. There are people in there that you can't see that are talking to each other. And you, the player, still have to feel a part of this experience. So you need, as the writer, you need to be thinking about this game in a less video gamey manner and more as a radio drama, pure audio manner. So how do you do this? How do you communicate the player's actions without the player seeing them doing these actions? You use the NPCs to describe the environment. They look at things and they tell you what they see, but only where it's key to plot, because it can get quite tiring hearing them saying, oh, there's a tree there, it looks green, there's a zombie next to it, you don't want that. You don't want that happening too often, at least. And you can use your NPCs, non-playing characters, by the way. Um, you can use their tone and reaction to convey their feelings towards the players, the urgency of the situation, a confirmation of the players' actions when they've made a choice in your app, things like that, to make sure that they feel like the characters in the game are responding to them and, you know, their whatever they've imagined in their head <coughs> regarding what they're doing in the game is confirmed to them. Use more dialogue, use more sound effects. Don't use the typical fallback to text option where you have some audio that plays and then a text summary of what just happened and you know, letting the players ignore the story and just reading through what's just happened because that's not the ethos of your game and you shouldn't be doing that. Don't use quick time event type kick, punch, dodge type things because in an audio-based interactive fiction game, you don't want the players to decide I'm going to kick with my right leg and then punch with my left arm and headbutt with my head, because what else? But you don't want them to be thinking in that level of detail. It just breaks the immersion there, makes it a lot less fun to play. Abstract that kind of experience and try and think about larger choices like fight Gary the zombie or sneak past Gary the zombie. There is no Gary the Zombie in the game, this is not a spoiler. But give them those kinds of choices rather than how you fight or the intricate nitty gritty details that you would normally have in a video game or in a text-based interactive fiction game. Finally, players can miss audio cues or story hints that you think are obvious. So that's why I've said embrace ambiguity because not everyone is going to be on the same page as how you want them to be, or even within the group that they're playing with. And your story has to, make, has to make sense to them, even if they don't understand all of it. You need to communicate what they need to be doing next as clearly as possible, but your story also needs to stand up when they just don't get it. This is inevitable in audio, especially when you're playing a very distracting real-time card game, as we found out. So don't let the story hinge on players catching details presented only once or twice. Now representing your player in game, how does the player know who they are when they don't speak, they don't have a voice, they don't have an appearance, but they are still the core part of this game? Giving them an actual voice through an actor from a specific origin of a specific gender breaks the immersion. This is me playing, I don't sound like that, I don't look like whoever I visualize that person to be. And this was a game that we made for one to four people. So you have four different viewpoints going on at the same time. So how do you not break immersion there? The way you do this is by trusting that the players will fill in the gaps when you provide them the start of the story. And the way you provide them the start of the story is by placing them in an action event. So with Zombies Run, for example, in season one, mission one, you basically have a helicopter that crashes and the player that doesn't speak is the one that's running and relies on a radio operator from a random settlement that is helping them escape some zombies and come towards safety. And you are that player, you've already met these people on the radio, and they've realized you carry supplies and you can do useful things for them, and that's why they're trusting you, and that's why you're trusting them. In Zombies Run, the board game, we've got all of you trying to have a nice holiday on this nice Caribbean island called St. Florian. You land at the airport, you're going through customs, and oops, zombies ruin your holiday. 
So you're going through customs, you start like seeing people who are being eaten by zombies or trying to escape them. You start in the middle of that action and you choose if you're going to save these people or if you're going to abandon them. And that's how you form your group and that's how you escape the airport and continue through the rest of the story. So it's really important to place your player at a starting point that provides them that entry into the story, even more important in audio than it is in any other kind of narrative because they can't see themselves within that story. Finally, this concept of a supportive protagonist rather than the main dramatic acting one. This was one of the largest leaps that we had to make. How will a protagonist convey decisions or instructions to one of the other NPCs without a voice? It becomes fairly tedious to handle this through lots of buttons and text and all that. Like I said, you have to abstract the choices that you want the players to make and you don't want the players to make. Um, we decided to avoid back and forth conversations completely and chose to focus on the player's role within the in-world team. So for example, helping the NPCs feel more confident in taking action. And this would sometimes unlock unique character abilities for those NPCs. As Matt once put it, this changes the relationship between the PCs and the NPCs and recontextualizes the player's power in the game world from that of a primary actor to that of a supportive, nurturing ally. You can tell he's the writer and not me, right? Next and final challenge that I'm going to address here is attention control. So there's this real-time card game going on and everyone's excitedly playing it. There's tension because you've got five zombies lined up and you've got to escape them. How do you make sure that they pay attention to the app? How do you make sure that they look at it and pay attention to what's going on, know that another zombie is being added, know that there's an optional storyline that's being offered to them, things like that. So don't use notifications that players have to dismiss. That's the first thing we realized while playtesting because it gets incredibly annoying to have multiple pop-ups on your screen that players have to consciously say, I ignored you, I'm sorry, go away. Um, you need to have audio cues so that players who are paying attention to audio can look at the app while they're playing the card game and realize something's going on. You also need to have a visual indication to reinforce that because players can miss that while loud conversation is going on. Let it stay on the screen for a while, let it linger. Don't let the first notification go away when the second one comes up because players will miss the first one, but then they'll try and catch up when they notice one of the notifications. And finally, don't make your story hinge on something that the players have to notice while focusing on this other card game. Design your game to fail gracefully. If there are optional encounters in your story like we did, um, make sure that your main story does not hinge on the players experiencing each one of those things. If you're really keen on it, you can teach your players to pay attention by having some kind of consequence happen that shows them things are happening while you're running and not paying attention to the screen. So start paying attention to the screen. If you need to, you can do that, but make sure your story can fail gracefully. So we identified a lot of these issues actually during playtesting, which is why I'm going to talk to you about the three main changes that we made to the game through playtesting. A visual redesign of the app, make sure your puzzles can be understood by people who didn't design them, and a complete graphical overhaul of our cards to make sure that people of all kinds of abilities can understand them in the heat of the moment. So let's look at the companion app first. So the board game setup is basically one to four people around a table. There's an app on a phone sitting somewhere in a corner. There's a bunch of cards that they're playing with. There's a map that's open. There's the game box that's got lots of envelopes in it that you access at some point. So the app is the only way that we as the creators of the game can communicate to the players while the game is happening. And we started out thinking we need to have as much information on there as possible. And we decided, all right, the players need to know where they are, where they started from, where they're going, all the zombie hordes that are near them, how dangerous their run is, things like that. And that's why you see the prototype placeholder app there, because our developer just mocks something up in order for us to work with. But you realize that that's a lot of information, and players in the heat of the moment aren't going to be paying much attention to that. 
And if they start ignoring things and they start having consequences, they're not going to have much fun playing the game. It's not an exam for them to remember all the right answers. It's not an exam for them to be paying attention all the time. And you can't make them feel bad about themselves while playing a game because you're supposed to be having fun. So we decided to despec everything. This is the typical thing any producer will tell a creative, despec, despec, despec. And that's what we decided to do. So we went from that graphical interface, which was just a developer prototype anyway, to that text-based interface that we fondly call Nokia. Because a good old Nokia phone is quite um, simple to use. It's reassuring in how familiar it is. It's a brick. It will survive any apocalypse. <laughs> and it will give you the information you need when you need it without any faff. So that's why we switched to Nokia. But then we realized that the app had some limitations forced onto it by the nature of the UI being just text-based. We couldn't provide any symbols because players, when they're trying to escape some zombies, aren't going to want to read sentences and instructions there. They just want to see a heads-up display that tells them, hey, these are the three things that you should be remembering. They don't want to see you know, a lot of text with updates that have happened and updates that are going to happen and the persistent notification that they have to dismiss. So we switched to something called Silver when we switched to Unity as well. So Silver is a UI that's based on um, the underused Game & Watch aesthetic. So this involves individual frames appearing and disappearing to create a sort of Unique, but you know, fun style of movement, it creates a sense of movement by appearing, blinking, appearing, blinking, appearing, blinking, but moving across your screen, which is what you can see there with the zombies that are chasing the runner. And it makes things a lot easier to understand while your head is distracted playing a real-time game. We think this makes the app look more modern, but it also has that comforting retro feel of thick lines and thick text and you know, simple, simple graphics, nothing colorful, nothing too special. This works in landscape as well as portrait mode because we realized from playtesting that that's something that players wanted. We had colors to signal when to play the card game and when to stop and listen, so it's green while you're running and it's red while you're listening to something. But there are other UI indicators as well to make sure that colorblind people don't have issues with that. And we have symbols as well as text. So you can see that instead of saying one zombie detected, like if you look at that, there are lots of collected something and zombie proximity and things like that. You don't have that kind of text. Instead, you just have symbols that show zombies advancing or one zombie added or two zombies added. The next thing we learn through playtesting is that one single playtesting session can give you lots of lessons. And when you're on a low budget and you need to make sure you get the most value out of every single session that you do, this is a lovely way to keep track of things. So it would basically be three or four people playing the game. We'd have a camera hooked up that would be recording the whole thing. And Matt and I would be hovering like protective mother hens, watching how everything is going and trying to explain our sort of bash together rules that weren't really completed and things like that. So at the outset, we realized that Matt was handling, handing people envelopes instead of them naturally realizing that at this point, yes, I have to access that envelope. Then we realized that in certain puzzles, in this case, for example, there's a power plant that provides clean water through the, to the island, and you need to go and fix it, otherwise it'll break down and the island will run out of water in a few days. We realized one of the people who came to the playtest had experience in how a power plant worked, and, <laughs> oh God, what do we do now? Because they're reading all sorts of things into the instructions that we didn't necessarily mean. <laughs> Then we realized there were gaps in the rules. So for example, while the players are playing their game, sometimes they're holding cards in their hands. There's this gap of what do you do with the card in your hand when a challenge starts? Do you place it down or do you put it back in the box or do you not do anything with it? We had to address these kinds of things and we realized that kind of thing only when we play tested it. And finally, when you run through a gate in a power plant, the natural question any player will ask you is, can I go back and close that gate? But no, we didn't think about it. So these are the small kinds of things that you'll realize when you do even one playtest. And you need to make sure that you make the maximum use out of it when you do that. 
And finally, a complete visual overhaul of the card design. So we first started out with that. So that's basically everything you need to know about that card in text form or basic graphical form on that card. And you can see a lot of problems with that. For example, people who have learning difficulties have difficulty looking at black on white and white on black. Um, people will have trouble reading things when zombies are chasing you and you're stressed out. You don't want them sitting for two minutes and reading that card and then deciding, oh, that's how I use it. The zombie's gotten you by then. So you need to start thinking about how fast your gameplay is, what kind of information is optimal for the players to have, what is just craft and you know, just need to get rid of all of that. So we moved to what you see at the end, which is from one of our final printed boxes, which has clear symbols on either end and no text at all, an image in the background that reinforces what that card is and a mix of colors as well as symbols so that you're not excluding colorblind people. And that Information is all that you need. You don't need special powers that have text that need to be read during the game while you're running. We just removed all of that. And all this is what we learned through playtesting. As you can tell, three important changes just transform the game, which is why playtesting is important and everybody should do it. Finally, designing your milestones well. So I originally wanted to call this design your deadlines well, but deadlines only do two things, make a whooshing sound as they fly by, and give you a lot of stress. So I think milestones are a better way of looking at it. They are a technical term in making production plans and things like that, but think of a milestone as something you've achieved and make sure you achieve it often so that you can celebrate it. Because I can tell you the process of making a game is stressful. You hear all these things about the industry and all that, you want your team to be feeling good about the things they're achieving, and you want to celebrate their wins frequently. But you don't want them to feel like you know, you're doing it for the sake of it, for team spirit, whatever that means. So you need to make sure that you have closely spaced markers on your plan that allow you to continuously evaluate how you're doing. It is useful as well, and also allows you to celebrate the achievements of your team. This is a spreadsheet that I exported from this program called Omniplan. So when we were doing our Kickstarter plan, we had all these tasks that various people had to do. We had a sound designer, we had our writer, we had me trying to talk to different producer, uh, production companies to get quotes. We had our CEO who had to like approve things, who was helping with the design as well. We had our artist. All these people have different parallel tasks. Sometimes one blocks the other. And Sometimes one has to happen, and then five of them have to happen, and then one more has to happen. So Omniplan had this nice Gantt chart kind of view that you could plan this well on, and this was great because it sat on my laptop, I could fiddle with it at any point, except no one else could get it because it was on my laptop. And this is what it exported to. So the biggest lesson we learned from this was make sure you have a production plan that everybody can see, and don't try and protect your creatives from the production plan by saying, you don't need to know that, it's okay, I'll just tell you what you have to do. Don't do that. Make sure everybody can see where you are, what you need to be doing, where you're going behind, things like that. I moved from Omniplan to a notebook because I thought, all right, if I understand the plan well, I can hold frequent meetings and communicate it with other people. That didn't work out either because, again, people had to come and sit with me and talk to me in order to understand what was missing, what needed to be done, where they were in the overall structure of things. So I made a lot of mistakes during the process and here's me showing my mistakes to you so that you understand not to do them. And finally, this is the biggest lesson that we learned during the entire planning process. It's a story-based game. It doesn't mean you need to write the entire story and then play it. Like Chris said, games and story systems have to interact well together. So chunk your narrative the way that you are chunking your project management. If you have, well, in our case, for example, we had an eight-hour game. We divided this into six main scripts and six side quests and you know environmental events and things like that. And we did our playtesting as well in the form of focusing on one main script and a couple of these side scripts, depending on where we need it. This allowed us to easily iterate these story modules 
without having to worry about what effect it would have in the future. Because as soon as we had a draft of something going, we would just play test it within ourselves first, go back and edit it a little bit, then have an external play test where other people tried it and hopefully didn't poop all over it. But it helped us go back and refer to things and change things quickly rather than write an entire thing and break our hearts because you know we had to scrap the whole thing. Frequent yet substantial wins is important again because I said you need to celebrate your achievements with your team. You also need to continue progress with your project and chunking your narrative lets you see, I finished this much of the story. I don't have to go and look at that anymore. I can just move forward. And finally, killing your darlings. So that is a set of meeting notes from around late 2015 or early 2016. And you can see the audio engine includes days, so the concept of time in the game, a limited number of actions at home, so a home base that you work out of and you perform actions in to improve or upgrade, like all these video games that you see, and a single run or mission that you do. So this is a lot of information to provide a player, and it's, it, it gets really confusing, it muddles the narrative, and is just plain bad idea when you have audio. But we didn't realize that at the outset. Thankfully, because we chunked our narrative, the place where this came into play was Crypt 4, which referred to some roving zombie hordes around the map, and they moved over a course of a few days and things like that, so which is why we needed the concept of time. And we had a printed physical map that was in 2D, and we needed that translated into a 2D map in the game, so that the game could know where these hordes were and tell you. You as the player understand it, in a way that you can refer to the map and know where they are. So we started out with thinking we needed to build this entire world within the game and we needed to have time that was elapsing and things like that. We didn't have time for any of that stuff. When we did playtests, we realized it's going to be far too complicated and for the sake of one script, there was no point trying to break ourselves trying to build that. So instead, I went and did that. That is a spreadsheet, the bane of all interactive fiction games. I mean, I know people say don't use a spreadsheet, but this was the easiest way. This is basically the area of the printed map that the zombie hordes can run around in. It's true if the horde can exist there. It's false if it's a water body. Zombies don't go into water. And it's false around the edges so that they don't run over into the ocean or into places that have walls that they can't cross. I did this because it was the simplest way to translate that map into the game without overloading our developer, overloading me, overloading anybody else and missing our milestones. And this is a little bit of code I can go through in detail with you later where I hack this in possibly the worst way possible because I am not a developer. So there's a coordinate, let's say JJ54, on your map where a horde is present. I break that into the two characters, JJ and the number 54. I split JJ into J and J. That's what you see there. And I increment J when it moves north so that you know it's JK. And I increment, no, I decrement the Y so that it's going in another direction. So that's, you have the new variable JK and it might be 55 depending on where it's going. And that's a number that you can deal with, so that's okay. And I gave each of the hoods an X and a Y that was within this true-false Boolean array that I'd made. And these X and Ys also translated into the map's coordinates, so a JJ54. So it's just a bunch of code that I hacked together. It works. That's how, you know, that's how the reality of these things happen. <laughs> and um, that was basically it. So instead of trying to do this huge thing that would have taken far too long and served minimal purpose, we just ended up doing what was needed to be done. So I just wanted to conclude by summarizing this. So audio first interactive fiction comes with various challenges. Um, it's very important that you playtest your story as soon as possible from the moment that you have a first draft going, just go through it with somebody else. And also very important that you test the interaction of your story with your mechanic because that's basically what the entire player experience is going to be, and it has to be baked in from the beginning. And finally, design your milestones well. Like, if you don't take away anything else from this presentation, remember that you need to celebrate the work that you are doing as frequently as possible, so break it down into little bits, 
have a little fun when you're done with a big task, a big task that's hopefully not too big, and it will help you in the long run because you've planned it well in order to do that. And that's it. Thank you for listening.